check, check. What was that? I got your back. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, hopefully, at some point here, we will double in size as people trickle in. But um, after I got finished with the presentation notes last night, I realized there was a um, classic mistake I make of getting way too much in there. So I decided we're starting at 6 promptly. So <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and we'll go ahead and get started. But first, because we are talking about worship, I thought it might be appropriate um, if TJ led us in a hymn after we pray. So we'll sing together in just a moment. Father, we thank you so much that we are gathered together in the name of your son and because of him. And as we consider together as a church um, this most glorious gift that you've given to us of being able to enter your presence and worship you, we pray that you would form our thoughts, uh, unite our hearts, and grant us a wonder um, at just the Christ-centeredness of all that we do, and that you would be honored in our worship, in our witness, and in our fellowship. Please bless this evening. And uh, as you continue to do good things, as Lord Jesus, you are building your church. And it is by the Spirit and through your name that we pray. To the glory of the Father. Amen. And if you would please stand, we'll sing together. saints darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see.
All right. So that moment when your uh, remote control from your phone stops working right when we need it for the slide change. So that was just a brief panic. We're good. The Lord's been gracious. And uh, welcome to, I guess, our talk, <laughs> which is we're calling Rhythms of Worship, which is uh, basically a look at why we worship the way we do. And there are handouts at the front on both sides. If anybody needs one, these are the full notes for what we're doing tonight. And for those who are joining us, we're live online, right? Okay. For those who are joining us online, welcome. Hopefully it's a few. We didn't tell anybody we were going to be streaming this because we wanted people to come. So um, now my favorite way to kind of start tonight is I heard today um, that there was a sibling conversation in a household that will go unnamed, um, where one of the kids was bemoaning the fact that Awana is not happening. And explaining what was going on, the older sibling said, we're all together tonight so Pastor Rick can tell us everything he wants to change. <laughs> Which is exactly what is not happening. Uh, as, you, as will be clear going through this evening, I do love liturgy, but not for liturgy's sake. And quite frankly, it's not something I brought to the table. This was a conversation that in God's providence, um, as the elders were considering worship, that was a conversation that was already happening. Um, it just happens to coincide with the fact that a pastor who loves liturgy was called by the Lord here. And so we're going to talk first about worship just generally, because any, any conversation about liturgy and how we worship that's divorced from a theology of why we worship uh, it's just not going to make sense, and it's going to risk being formalism. And I don't think we're interested in formalism. We want to worship in spirit and in truth. And so first we're going to talk about just the centrality of worship, because there's a lot of ideas about the Christian life. And if you ask any given professing believer in this country, what is the Christian life about, you'll get any number of answers. Um, maybe only a very small fraction of them which are going to include worship. And yet when we look at scripture, we see very clearly that whatever else it means to be human, we are worshipers by nature. We see this, you know, for example, in Isaiah 43, uh, verses 6 through 7, when the Lord says, I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him, yes, I have made him. Is it safe to say that if we are created for God's glory, then we are created for worship? Because worship directly brings glory to God. And when you think of all the things that we do on this side of heaven that continue over into eternity, one of them, which has a direct continuation, but it just gets better because we see him, is worship, right? Can you think of a scene in scripture where we are getting a glimpse of God's throne room that doesn't involve worship? Worship is central to what it means to be created in God's image. And in fact, we can say that the primary problem with sinful man apart from Christ is not that he's not a worshiper, it's that he has a worship disorder. And so Paul, when he's talking about why every single person is condemned apart from Christ, he goes to worship. He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because... What may be known of God is manifest to them, for God has shown it to them. In other words, every eye in this world that has the capacity to make sense of reality has the capacity to, to see that God, there, there are some truths about God that every person is accountable for. Okay? So Paul says that since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Okay? So just creation itself testifies to his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. So what God has shown us in creation is enough to make us accountable as worshipers. Now here's the problem. Although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. In other words, idolatry, right? Man doesn't stop being a worshiper because of the fall. He switches his worship and creates substitutes. 
So every single person you've ever met, ever, is a worshiper by nature because they're human. We can't escape worship. And finally, just not to belabor the point, um, the Christian life, oh, if anybody's filling in the blanks, the problem with Romans 1, 8, 18 through 23 that we see is worship exchange. Okay, it's worship exchange. So in Isaiah, to be created for God's glory is to be created for worship. In Romans, to be human is to worship, but now it's a worship exchange problem. And then here in Romans 12, we see the scope of worship, which is that the Christian life is one of whole person worship. Okay, so Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So because Jesus has come, instead of bringing animals to a temple, we bring ourselves as living sacrifices to God. So all of who we are is a living sacrifice on the altar because Jesus is our once for all sacrifice that atones for our sin. Worship. We are worshipers by nature. Now, J.I. Packer helpfully uh, gives us an, a definition of worship, but because he's a theologian, it's a few sentences, it's, so we'll distill it down after that to something that we can take home with us. J.I. Packer says that worship in the Bible is the due response of rational creatures, okay, so as thinking creatures made in God's image, this is our due response to the self-revelation of their creator. In other words, God's revealed himself and therefore, that has implications for us. And the implications are worship. It is an honoring and glorifying of God by gratefully offering back to him all the good gifts and all the knowledge of his greatness and graciousness that he has given. It involves praising him for what he has done, thanking him for what he has done, desiring him to get himself more glory by further acts of mercy, judgment, and power, and trusting him with our uh, concern for our own and others' future well-being. I think what Packer is getting at is what Paul says in Romans. Everything is on the table in worship because God is worthy of all of it. Okay? But if we want to just be a little more simple than that, I think we could say accurately that worship is the whole person intentionally aimed at knowing, loving, and glorifying God in every part of life. So young men, when you're out mowing your lawn because dad decided he didn't want to do it anymore, you should be worshiping. In other words, do it for the glory of God. That doesn't mean you need to sing the whole time. Singing is a part of our worship, but it is not worship as if other parts weren't. All of life lived for the glory of God is worship. It's all of us for all of God, Christ, okay? Now, that happens in different contexts. There is such a thing uh, as worship in a strict sense and worship in a broad sense. We've just been talking about worship in its broadest sense, right? Which we've seen from those passages among so many others in Scripture. That is, all of life is the context of worship. Okay, so what, and we won't need to talk any more about that. But then there's this thing that um, especially the Puritans would call secret worship. Secret worship, which is simply to say, my quiet time. Right? That's what we call it since, you know, we live now. <laughs> uh, it's, our, it's our individual worship. And we see this in scripture. This is the normal Christian life. It is God's expectation in saving somebody that they would be spending time with him in worship. For example, David's commitment in Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. That's a singular, individual commitment every day to worship God. We see Jesus doing this. He models it for us. He says, it says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. If it's good enough for Jesus, wait, if Jesus thought he needed to do that, how much more we who are not God, <laughs> right? Our individual worship. And then finally, in Matthew 6, this is just expected. It is the commandment. We see it in, um, in the Sermon on the Mount. When, when you pray, go into your room, and when you've shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, 
uh, who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. This is us and God alone, um, an appointment that we don't want to miss. And it's not a legalistic thing as if, I didn't do this today. I better go ahead and do this before I go to bed. Otherwise, God's not going to be happy with me. No. Friends, we are saved by grace, not legalism. This is the privilege of fellowship with God. And it's our individual secret worship. And it's called secret because it's just, nobody sees it. <laughs> but then there's this other context, and this is perhaps the most ignored context of worship in the church of the 21st century, in America at least. And that is family worship. Well, what do we mean by family worship? We mean three simple things, basically. It's a family gathered together around a Bible for maybe 10 minutes a day. Um, again, this isn't a legalistic thing, but this is family gathered together for three things, reading the Bible, praying together, and singing. It is one of the most, if not the most impactful thing that you will do outside of the walls of a church for the discipleship of your family and the legacy of faith for generations. I've heard it said that if you um, want to fill up an Olympic-sized swimming pool and you need it done tonight and you've got one cup, don't start this morning, right? Start 18 years ago. One cup a day, insignificant on any given day. Over the course of 18 years, what do you have? You have a full pool. That's family worship. And we see it in the commitments, uh, the commands actually, like in Deuteronomy, right at the heart of the Mosaic law. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. So there's the individual part, right? A parent's heart must be the Lord's. And then, being holy the Lord's, um, I was supposed to go on, well, you know the rest of the passage, right? You shall teach th them to your children diligently as you sit in your house, as you go by the way, when you rise and when you go to bed. In other words, frame your child's and your family's life in the context of the word of God. And, and there's a formal place to do that, which is family worship. Read, pray, and sing. That's it. It doesn't need to be complicated, but it is simple and it's powerful. And then Joshua's commitment. Um, therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, which you're just like, why do you say that? That's weird. Like, we just got brought out of Egypt 40 years ago, and now we're going into the promised land, and you think it might seem evil to serve the Lord? In which case, what were those 40 years like? Right. We need to, we need to make a decision. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And when we look at the definition of liturgy and what the word actually means, it actually means service. So Joshua is making a commitment. He and his family are going to worship. Okay. And then the third context we're quite familiar with, it's what we gather to do as the church. It's corporate worship. The longest sustained treatment of corporate worship in the Bible is 1 Corinthians 11 through 14. Okay? The longest sustained treatment of worship in the church, specifically, is 1 Corinthians 11 through 14, which I'm not going to read to you. We only have an hour. But we do see the command in Hebrews 10, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Now, how do we stir one another up to love and good works? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more uh, as you see the day approaching. In other, in other words, the closer we get to the return of Christ, we ought to be more resolved to meet together as the church in worship. And apparently some, even in the first century, were like, no, we're good. Individual worship, maybe family worship. And they weren't taking corporate worship seriously. But corporate worship is the confluence of those other contexts. Your own worship and your family's worship begs for corporate worship as the fullness of its expression. Those are the contexts of worship. To bring up um, a confession again, because I always get wary of thinking that we're doing new things when we're a 2,000-year-old church. 
um, were on good shoulders. Um, the reformers and their children um, in their different confessions, but again, I'll go to the London Baptist Confession because hello, we're Baptists. Uh, God is to be worshiped everywhere in spirit and in truth as in private families daily and in secret, each one by himself, so more solemnly in the public assemblies. There's our three contexts which are not carelessly nor willfully to be neglected or forsaken when God, by his word or providence, calls thereunto. In other words, worship in, in private, families, and the church. And those are the contexts of worship. And if I seem like I'm going too fast, I'm kind of hoping to be able to have a little Q&A at the end. So that's where we're going. Okay. So normally I would ask for questions along the way, but we'll go ahead and do that at the end. Now, this is all good and fine, but let's look at the commands of worship. Because if we're ultimately going to be talking tonight about why we as Sylvania Church worship the way we do, which is now going to be um, with a more formal or visible liturgy, then it would be helpful to know what's shaping that. And I would say that the first thing is the command that we worship in reverence. I think probably there's a good chance that most of us have been in worship services at some point in our life that are quite um, irreverent, right? I grew up as a child of the passion movement, and I have nothing against the passion movement. It, God worked through that in my life. But I can remember some worship services or events that I was in where I, um, I'm just grateful that the Lord wasn't still dealing out lightning in judgment T to me personally because I didn't understand what worship was. But whatever worship is about, it's about coming before a holy God in joy, yes, but joy is not the same as carelessness. Joy and reverence are married in worship. And liturgy helps us to be intentionally reverent. We see this at the end of Hebrews 12, when we see this contrast between Mount Sinai and the, and the doom and gloom of the law, as it were, and the joy of, how, of now through Christ coming to Mount Zion. And he concludes that chapter and he says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, which that's awesome, right? Can we just like, if you're going to have a kingdom, get an unshakable one. That's what, where we are. Okay, because we have that, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Why? For even though it's all of grace, our God is still a consuming fire. And we want to make sure we honor the holiness of God in our worship and in our joy. We see this in Revelation, in this glorious scene of worship, that before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. I haven't seen that here yet, and that's actually probably good. Can you imagine what Paulette would do on the piano if one of these creatures showed up in worship? She might miss a note, which she probably hasn't done since 1990. My word. The first living creature was like a lion, the second like a calf, the third living creature had the face of a man, the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle, and what are they doing? They do not rest day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. It's reverence. That's reverence. Wherever we see worship in scripture, it's reverent and it's joyful. Now, specifically to why liturgy? Well, that has to do with the command of God, of the boundaries of, of worship. The commands that we see in scripture regarding worship help us. Um, the boundaries, in the process of time, look at this, we have worship happening from the beginning, right? Cain and Abel, that's pretty early, and they're both worshiping. Cain, in the process of time, brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. So there was something deficient about Cain's worship, which means that there must have been some kind of revelation from God about how he wanted to be worshipped. Cain disregarded the revelation. Abel walked in it. And we see the difference. Okay? There is a way that God desires to be worshipped. That's a boundary. We see this as God is giving worship in Exodus in the tabernacle system. So this is something that keeps coming up in his instructions in the back half of Exodus. 
according to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of its furnishings. Just so you shall make it. And then at the end uh, of the chapter, see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. And then at the end, it gets into all that detail again as Moses sets up the tabernacle and it says, just as the Lord had shown him, so he did it. And then what's the result? The Lord's glory fills the tabernacle. God approves. So next time you're reading Exodus and you're wondering why the tedious detail, God's preaching. He's preaching. And what's he preaching? It's not up to us how we worship the God who tells us how to worship. Okay? We would never know him savingly apart from his revelation. Why would we make up how to worship him? No, God cares. Those are the boundaries. In fact, this is exactly what we see Paul saying to Timothy when he says, because again, the context is corporate worship. I first exhort all of all uh, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all those who are in authority, that we may live quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and fear. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. This is an example of a specific command that God gives of what he wants to take place when the church is gathered. He wants prayers. He wants prayers. Okay? These are the commands. These are the boundaries. There's so many more, but again, I'm just giving you an example. But then, one of the other advantages of worship, um, one of the things we see commanded is Bible-informed order. Okay? Bible-informed order. Again, we've all probably been in worship services that seemed quite disordered, quite chaotic, and they never seem to play those kind of uh, worship songs at Christian day spas, right? Because it's not soothing. It would raise your heart rate, not make you feel less anxious. Why doesn't God want pandemonium in worship? Well, he tells us God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So there is an ordered way to worship, and there's a disordered way to worship. Let all things, again, he says, be done decently and in order. And just so you know, there, I, don't, I don't think I've ever heard of a time in Sylvania's history where there's been disordered worship. That's not what's being said. What is being, it, we're setting the context for where are the elders wanting to lead in our worship service from this point. And it's simply because we want to continue to be faithful. And we want to honor all of what God says about worship. And this is the last time I'll quote um, a confession tonight. <laughs> this is how the reformers and their, their children and their stepchildren were thinking of it. The acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will. That's the boundary. We stick to what God has revealed about worship. Uh, that he may not be worshiped according to the imagination and devices of men, nor the suggestion of Satan, under any visible representations or any other way that is not prescribed in the Holy Scriptures. I used to live in Portland, and it is true, the city's motto is keep Portland weird. And some of the churches took that to heart. Um, there was, I remember one worship service at a church uh, that I was not a part of, where during the sermon, um, a woman came up and, and painted. And so there was a painting happening on stage during the preaching, which number one, preacher, don't you want the people to listen? Why are you providing a distraction? But two, um, one of the reasons we aren't going to have a painter on stage, aside from the fact of how Paulette looked when I just said that that happened, um, is because uh, we're, we're not commanded to do that in Scripture. And we want to stick to the commands of Scripture as we worship. Now, one other thing we need to say as those who are worshiping under the context of the new covenant, not the old covenant. Why do we not, you know, because why don't we sacrifice? Why don't we have an altar here with um, a butcher on Sundays? Well, because we're not under the old covenant. We are under the new covenant, and that changes things. One of the other things that happens in both the old covenant and the new, but if it was true in the old, how much more now that Christ has come is worship is Christ-centered, explicitly Christ-centered. In the old covenant, that was shown in types and shadows and, and all sorts of things that the elders have been talking about on Wednesday nights in their class. But now the fullness has come. We've seen the revelation, and there's no more sacrifice. There's no more shadow. There's only the fullness, which is Jesus. And so as, 
so much of Hebrews, right, is all devoted to explaining this shift of the covenant and what it means for us now. And in there, there's a lengthy section on worship. And what the author of Hebrews says is this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. And we know who that high priest is, right? The author of Hebrews has told us. Um, in fact, the women are studying on uh, Wednesday morning, right? Jesus is better. He's the better Moses. He's the better sacrifice. He's the better high priest. Jesus is the center of our worship. And then in, in the next chapter, it says that Christ came as the high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he pleaded the most holy place, or he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So something you're going to see, and you are going to love this, is as we look at our liturgy and, and why we are structured the way we do, the whole structure itself, the thing underneath the structure, we're telling the story of the gospel. We are showing Jesus by the order of worship. And that is by design. That's a feature. Okay? Now, last thing before we look at the liturgy itself. We're going to look at the cadences of worship, the rhythm of worship. Because this, this whole thing, and I'm going to get into the whole standing and sitting, you know, and why do we stand so much? And then why do we sit down? Now, why do we kneel? And I was joking with the staff about, um, you know, worship exercise, you know, and kneel, confess, stand up, rejoice, and sit, and stand, and read. And it's just like, actually, we just did a worship, we just did a video. That's on YouTube. So that is, that is the first worship video that's been done since the 80s. Um, we're going to look at what liturgy is, because liturgy is about the rhythm of worship. And we need to know something about what it is so that we don't risk misunderstanding it and we don't risk formalizing it. Because liturgy is nothing new, obviously, but some people, when they sit in a liturgical service for the first time, the immediate question is, wait, are we Catholic? Right? I thought we had a Reformation. Um, and it's just like, yes, that's true. But liturgy never belonged to the Catholic Church itself, even if it started there in the church, because the Catholic Church, before it was the Roman Catholic Church, was the Catholic Church. So, what is liturgy? Well, here's a, a definition of it that helps us. The Greek word liturgia is used in the New Testament with the meaning of service or ministry. So in the most literal sense, when we have a worship service, we are having a worship liturgy. Every single church ever, pretty much, has liturgy. I would just say the most uh, most of the churches in the United States at this time don't know it and don't show it. But take your typical Southern Baptist church. Announcements, three songs, uh, sermon, song, leave. That's liturgy. That's the order. And that's all liturgy is, is, is what is the order of our worship and why do we do it that way? Um, the way that I would define liturgy for us as a church, is that liturgy is how we approach God in worship, especially the rhythms of, and here's the rhythms, God speaking through his word and his people responding in prayer and praise. Okay? It's the rhythm of in and out. God speaks, we respond. And isn't that the Christian life, no matter what your worship context? There's a reason we talk about Bible reading and prayer. And if you have, um, if you're discipling somebody and they say, yeah, I only read the Bible and I never pray, you would say, hey, let's do something about that. Or if it was the other way, you'd go, you yeah, maybe crack the word once in a while. Why? Because we need both, because that's the rhythm of worship. And it always starts with God speaking, because just by show of hands, how many of you on your own regenerated yourself, called yourself to Christ and believed without his help? Okay, great. That's why we start with a call to worship, because it always starts with God, because the gospel starts with God. We love him because, exactly. 
Now, in the church, there's always been liturgy, but liturgy in the way that it's thought of today, oh, it came from the Catholic Church wanting to shape the way that people thought about the Mass and what was happening specifically in the Eucharist. And we go, hey, that's not great because there's some really bad ideas about the Lord's Supper that took place over the course of the history of the church. And it's interesting. Who was more familiar with the, the pitfalls of Rome than anybody? Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, the reformers who gave their lives, the Huguenots in France, they knew. And so if you have something called the Reformation, and it's really... Let's start from scratch, but not really, because we don't get rid of everything, because some of it's really good and biblical. It's interesting to see what they reformed and what they didn't. They didn't get rid of liturgy. They reformed it. Um, if you look up John Calvin's liturgy that he used, I think, in Strasbourg, you're just like, dude, nobody's getting out of church ever. Like, let's make dinner plans together, not lunch plans. Like, it was a long liturgy. Okay, the reformers kept liturgy because they wanted to worship a holy God in reverence according to his word. It made it into their confessions, and it is a good thing for us as his people today, as the, as the, as the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the Reformation who stand on, uh, on the doctrines of grace and the solas. Now, some of the things that liturgy does for us as believers is it, is it hedges us against some pitfalls, which are pretty easy for us to, to fall into if we're not careful. Some of the things that liturgy does is it makes sure that our worship is Bible rooted, which is why when you open up one of our bulletins on any given Sunday, you see a lot of Bible because God is the one leading this. We see intention because we don't want to be haphazard and just show up on a Sunday morning and say, hey, what seems good to you today? There's a lot of thought that goes into the song selection. In fact, TJ is actually really stretching me because he's asking me Sunday night, hey, what are you preaching next week? And I'm like, dude, I'm just up from my nap. But there's intention because he's thinking about that all week long. And then it helps our worship to be rounded because we're letting God shape it through his word. We're not saying, hey, you know, I don't really like confessing my sin. <laughs> it didn't make me feel good. So we're just going to not do that. No, it's, it's there in the word. We're going to do it because when God sets the agenda, things go better, right? Now, some of the things that liturgy is not, it's not a straight jacket. Whoa. I was having a charismatic moment there. My screen was, was, my, was your screen doing that? It was zooming. All right. It's not a straight jacket. Liturgy, just because it, we see the contours there, is not meant to make us feel like this in our Christian life. Right? It's meant to be a conduit and a tool, not to be a tightrope. Which leads to our second thing. Liturgy is not exclusive. Please don't misunderstand what we're saying. We are not saying that Green Acres, now I haven't watched a worship service at Green Acres, but I'm assuming they're not a heavily liturgical church in the formal sense. Is that accurate? Okay. We're not saying that Green Acres is worshiping wrong. We're not saying that your really godly Baptist great-grandmother who never did liturgy a day in her life wasn't worshiping. Okay, this is not exclusive. And there's a reason why you'll see really good liturgies looking different from each other because you never open your Bible and see in the, New, in the New Testament church, you never see a divinely sanctioned liturgy. And if we do this here and then this here, or, then God's not happy. That's not what's going on. It's simply... How do we worship with intention according to God's commands and honor most, uh, as much as we can of what he said about what he loves in worship? That's what it is. So here's where we're going to walk through Sylvania's liturgy briefly. Now, for those of you who are allergic to proof texts, these are not proof texts underneath these um, aspects of worship. These are simply, I'm just showing you one among many places of scripture where these different aspects of worship are shown. Because I don't want us to ever wonder if we're making stuff up. But the first thing I want to draw your attention to as we look at our liturgy is you see on the side of your each, you know, all along the liturgy, there's like 12 elements. And they fall broadly into three sections, starting with the holiness of God, 
and then the sinfulness of man, and then the goodness of God in the gospel, and then our response to the gospel. That's because, friends, those are the, those are the contours of the gospel. The gospel doesn't begin with our problem. It begins with God's goodness, holiness, and justice. It, begin, it begins with him, to which we respond as those who need a savior, and then we have the goodness of Christ crucified and risen for us. Which, if you'll notice, there's a reason why over why half the liturgy about is just that gospel section. And it's because that's the dominant theme, right? This, this is how we're Christians. So that's, that's the contours of the liturgy. And we begin with a call to worship because God calls us to worship. Now, it took a group of, of like nine or ten elders and pastors to figure that out. God calls us to worship. We should do that. That was a joke. Um, okay, Psalm 95, 1. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Sweet, let's do that. Um, let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. And how about this? No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. God is drawing us through worship, which is why after the announcements, we have a call to worship so that we can hear from God's own mouth, as it were, in his word, come to me. And so when we respond, what is, what is the impulse when a, a, when a wonderful God like ours calls us to his presence? Let's exalt him. Right? That's, that's what we see in Isaiah, in Revelation. The impulse of everybody who catches a glimpse of God in his glory is to fall down on their face, either physically or literally. Wait, no, that is to say the same thing. Uh, or spiritually. And, uh, and exalt him. So we have these songs that are specifically geared toward extolling the majesty of God and his greatness. Now, when we enter the light of God's presence, what's the first thing we notice about ourselves? We are not like him. We actually have problems. And our biggest one of those problems is sin. It's sin. Which is why, oh, songs, uh, songs of exaltation. Uh, let, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. Yes, there we go. We are singing. Um, we have a call to Christ-likeness because we want to always be tailoring our confession specifically. Now, those of you who are married know the importance of this. If all you ever do in reconciling with your spouse after a tiff is to say, I'm sorry for all this stuff, then it's just like, um, great. Which stuff exactly are you apologizing for? You know, just the thing. <laughs> And you're just like, why do we keep falling into the same patterns in our marriage? It's because you never specifically attacked the problem, right? We want to specifically respond to some specific command. And so uh, John, 1 John 2, 6, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. We want to examine through a different command of scripture that usually is going to be tailored, always, actually always tailored to the theme of the sermon text. Where do we fall short specifically of bringing glory to God? Because unless we're getting specific about our sin, our sanctification will be shallow and it will not be specific sanctification. And then we have a confession of sin, both corporately and silently, where we're taking seriously, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. So our confession of sin is a joyful, hopeful, eager confession. Not because we're focusing on our loathsome selves, but because we're saved by grace. And when we come confessing our sins, we have a promise. We have a faithful God and a just God, and he's going to cleanse us. And that's a really good thing. Because that reminds us of exactly who we are. We are children of God. And that's a joyful thing. Which is why we don't end with confession. That would be depressing. We always move to an assurance of pardon. Which you continue to see the apostles doing in scripture. Paul says to the Corinthians, after a long series of rebukes. He says, I would remind you again um, of the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, but you didn't just receive it back then and then forget about it. No, it's the gospel in which you stand, and it's the gospel by which you are being saved. In other words, the entire Christian life, start to finish, yeah, it's framed by the gospel. And so we always have an assurance of pardon, and that pardon always comes through Christ in the gospel. And that, now, friends, when you're actually, you know, half awake 
and you think about the gospel, what do you want to do? I want to rejoice, which is why we have songs of rejoicing. Like Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And that's why we have those songs there after an assurance of pardon, because we, we, we want to praise Jesus for the gospel. And then we have a pastoral prayer, because like I read earlier from 1 Timothy 2, we're actually commanded to pray in corporate worship. And so one of the elders comes up and leads the congregation in a prayer over whatever concerns the Lord has laid on that elder's heart that week as he's been thinking about his prayer. And then we have a scripture reading. So a quick word about this standing thing, sitting, kneeling, all that. Does it matter what we do with our bodies? Depends. Does it matter that we're worshiping with all our lives? Does a worship service where we only worship sitting down, is it possible to glorify God there? Yes, absolutely. Yes, it's about the heart. But we are of a nature, embodied souls. What is going on with our souls usually gets reflected through our external bodies and our circumstances, right? So one of the reasons in our liturgy we are intentionally standing at certain points, kneeling during confession, is because our posture matters. And when we kneel before a holy God in confession, that's our bodies saying, here we are, um, we need you. It's a, it's a posture of humility that spurs on our souls to be humble. Um, some of our uh, brothers and sisters who are more comfortable with it will raise their hands as they're singing about Christ's sacrifice. Why? They're not gaining it. I hope they're not trying to gain attention for themselves. They're realizing we are, we are standing before a God who is so good that we see the psalm saying, lift your hands in praise. And we do that because that brings glory to God. You don't have to raise your hands, but what we do matters. And so we stand for the scripture reading because we see that, right? Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. They stood up in reverence for the reading of God's law. And then for the next large portion of the day, there was a sermon about what they read. I don't know if they stood for that, but we sit for the sermon because I want you to be with me during the sermon, not keeling over or just wondering, when's he going to be done? Now, you may already wonder that, but that's not my problem. And so Paul says, till I come, give attention to reading and to exhortation and to doctrine. Preach the word. And we're just like, okay, we will. Right? That's one of the contours of worship. It's central because God is speaking to us through his word. And if we leave church on any given day saying, hey, who did we want to hear speak that day? Let's always opt for God. He's the one whose word we come to hear. And then we have the Lord's Supper. Um, um, right now we do it, we have the Lord's Supper, we observe it once a month, um, and when we observe it, we observe it here after the sermon, why? Because again, this is the rhythm of worship. The gospel is preached to us, and we respond by showing the gospel. This do as often as you take it in remembrance of me. We've heard his work preached, and we remember that work physically in the sacrament that he gave us. And then finally, we have a song of response every week. Because when we hear God calling us to something, when we hear his goodness preached to us, we again, we want to respond to his word. If God simply gives us his word and says, okay, I'm out, and then he drops the mic, we're just kind of like, what do we do now? Well, I'll tell you what we do. We worship that God. And so we respond in a song, something like, take my life and let it be. When would we sing a song like that? After we've heard him tell us to give him our lives and let them be all that he has called us to be. And we plead with him in that song, have your way with us, O Lord, and use us for your glory. And then we go into his world as his people who have been shaped by his word. And then we are given his blessing because we're not saved to stay in church. The one thing that we are not going to be able to do in glory that we can do today is make him known out there. The Christian life is a missional life for every single one of us. 
and we are shaped as God's people in his world here in worship so that we can go out there and make worshipers. Because isn't that the commission? Go and make disciples, which put another way is literally go and make worshipers. What is the end result of the Christian life? It is that the world would be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And it didn't happen because we stayed in church. It, it happened because the church went out there and told the world. And then God did his sovereign work through his word. And the world believed. My word. <laughs> I honestly did not expect this, but I put a slide in just in case. Do we have time for q and A? I I didn't. I honestly didn't see that coming. Um, now, we don't have a microphone or anything, um, but if you're willing to project and anybody wants to ask any questions about anything we've looked at or liturgy, we've got some time to do that before we conclude. So, where are you on all this? What thoughts or questions do you have that you'd like to ask? And we can talk about that. Yes, Abby. Yeah. That's great, and yes, um, from the Bible. Um, so <laughs> it gets back to that change of the covenant. So Christ's coming is so radical that I've heard, I've heard that what Matthew's doing at the beginning of his book is he's showing that in Christ is the dawning of the new creation. Somebody told me that once. And with the new creation comes a change. No longer do we worship on the seventh day. We worship on the first day. Because when did the new creation begin? It began when Christ rose. And so very early on, we see the church gathering on what is called the Lord's Day. What is the Lord's Day? It's the day the Lord rose. And that day was Sunday. And so at the beginning of Revelation, John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's Day. That's a day that was recognized in the community of the new creation, which is called the church, as the day we gather. Because every Sunday is really, if you think about it theologically, every Sunday is a mini Easter. We don't have anything to gather for if our Savior's still in tomb. But he's risen, and that changes everything, including the doing away with the Sabbath day as a, uh, as a commanded um, central feature of the law of Moses. Okay, a lot of people say, if, what's the sign of the Mosaic covenant? And one of the most common wrong answers you're going to get is circumcision. Circumcision wasn't the sign of the Mosaic Covenant. It was the sign of the Abrahamic Covenant. The sign of the Mosaic Covenant was the Sabbath. There were all sorts of things you could do as an Israelite under Moses' law and not die. But if you violated the Sabbath, we're going to take you out back because it's the sign of the covenant. You violate that, you violate it all. Well, when Jesus came and fulfilled that covenant, he instituted the new covenant. And in that covenant, it's the dawn of a new creation we meet on the Lord's Day. And there's nothing wrong with Saturday Night Church. Um, according to our doctrine as Sylvania Church, we don't believe that Sunday is a Christian Sabbath. We believe that it's the Lord's Day when the church has gathered for the past 2,000 years. So that's why we gather on Sunday. That's a great question. Any other, uh, another question? Mm -hmm. Because we're Baptist. I'll tell you. Um, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Why? I'm going to do that for the video too. Why, why is the Lord's Supper observed once a month? Um, there are a few reasons. Historically, when the Roman Catholic Church really messed with the doctrine or of the sacrament, um, it became something that only the priests could participate in. And it was, it was reverenced in such a way because of their doctrine of the actual presence of Christ's body and blood and transubstantiation and all that, that it became a fearful thing. So when Martin Luther, as still a Catholic, offers his first Eucharist, he's trembling because what happens if I mess with the body and blood of Jesus? Now, as those who come out of the Reformation, um, one of the things that is a good impulse is we want to preserve the reverence. 
And as with most all habits in the Christian life, something we do all the time can easily become rote. Liturgy can become rote. And the answer is not to have liturgy. The answer is to be faithfully intentional about what we're doing. But John Calvin, he came into Geneva, and they were practicing the Lord's Supper once, I think, once a quarter. Um, and he, looking at scripture, he said, I, we need to do this weekly. And the city council of Geneva, because they had authority in the church, all he, the best he could get was once a month. Um, Baptists come out of a tradition where either quarterly or once a month is generally where it falls for the sake of primarily preserving reverence as we come to the table. So it's not a commanded reason, but it is a reason, and the impulse is good. But that doesn't mean it's the way it has to be. That's another discussion for another time. So great question. Another question? Yep, and that's the, the pitfall of a linear outline. Because actually, we're responding in the songs of adoration. We're responding in the corporate back and forth of the call to worship. We're responding in confession. So there is response through all of it. But just the basic contours of what goes where is simply to show the rhythm of the gospel. But that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. The question was, oh, I'm doing really bad at, at this stating the question thing. Why is there only a small portion of response in this outline when God calls us, the liturgy definition is that we are responding to God. And so the answer is we're responding to him all throughout, but this is a page and it, there's linear, it just lines. So do we have another question which I will repeat before I answer? Right, so the, the reason for the pastoral prayer, um, what, is the re what can I say about it? Yes, I am right now. I was in the middle of repeating it as I caught myself before you interrupted me, <laughs> missing it. Thanks, Mark. That guy can hit a home run, I mean literally. So uh, what can I say about the pastoral prayer? Got it? Okay. <laughs> We're commanded to pray, um, and so the... Um, the spiritual leaders of the church pray um, and lead us corporately in a whole host of concerns that we can corporately bring before God um, as we are approaching him together as his people. Um, we're going to have, actually, this is a great segue because in about 15 minutes, we're going to invite anybody who wants to spend half an hour in a prayer meeting together in Shane's classroom to do so because one of the things we mentioned a couple weeks ago after um, our announcement, uh, one of our heavy announcements recently, was that we need to be praying over what's going on in this church right now. And God is glorified when his people pray. We see the gathered church together in Acts praying. And so one of the ways that we give devoted time in our service to that is the pastoral prayer. And hopefully it's not just somebody up here for a few minutes praying while somebody out there takes a nap for those few minutes because their eyes are closed. But hopefully it is the communion of saints amening what's being prayed as the church gathers before the Lord, just like it, it did in Acts. So I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. You made it. Oh, we're praying for you, Patricia. Yeah, do we have a place for catechism, Mark? We do. Um, I repeated it. Do we have a place for catechism in corporate worship? Yes. So one of the things we're going to be doing and actually are doing before we observe the Lord's Supper is we are going to have a place for either part of a historic catechism or a confession of faith or a creed. 
because the whole purpose of catechism was passing on our common faith. Because there are boundaries of what is called the Christian faith. And inside of it, we are being faithful. And outside of it, we've left the faith. Well, we want to worship as those who are shaped by the faith. And so um, before we come to the Lord's Supper and commune with the church corporate in this, you know, all around the world, around that same table, um, we want to confess our faith together. So that would be a place for catechism that we do. Yeah. And if the frequency of the Lord's Supper ever changes the way that Calvin wanted, um, then it's, I'm not saying it will, I'm not saying it won't. I'm just saying if it does, we'll have more of that. <laughs> if it does. Um, any other, uh, another question? Yes, sir. Where did the tradition of standing up while worshiping come from? Um, well, we, like, for example, in Ezra, that portion that we read, when, the, when Israel gathered around the word of God, they stood up, and it was a posture of reverence. Um, we see standing in the Psalms. We see the, the Levites throughout the temple standing as they're singing and leading um, the songs that David wrote. So there's always been standing in worship. Yeah, that's a great question. Did I repeat it before I said it? Okay, I'm not, I'm not joshing you, Mark. I really am curious because I can't remember if I repeated it for the camera. Okay, one or two more. This is going well, so. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, a uh, couple couple areas. One in our right. Yes, I do. Thank you, uh, y'all. They didn't screen me for repeating questions in the pastoral <laughs> candidating process. Otherwise, I might not be here. Um, the question was: Is there a place for altar call, or a point of decision, or come talk to an elder or pastor if you would like to be saved? And that, there's two, two spots for that. One, the first and primary one um, would be in the preaching. Um, and it's not so much an altar call, come forward if you want to follow Jesus. But there's this constant call in the gospel where Jesus, like Matthew or Mark 1, 14 and 15, Jesus went throughout the regions preaching the gospel and declaring, repent and believe in the gospel. That's an altar call without an invitation to come forward. The invitation to come forward is actually a pretty novel aspect of church history that came with revivalism and some pretty questionable theology with it. Um, the call to repent and believe in the gospel is the altar call. But then in the bulletin, there is a section there that says, if anybody would like to come and speak with an elder after the service, these two elders will be here today to do that. Um, sometimes I'll say it in the service. If you'd like to talk with a pastor or elder, come find us. We're going to talk about that. Here's another great spot in the liturgy. In the liturgy. Our, our call to Christ likeness in our confession of sin. Because on any given Sunday, there is almost assuredly somebody here who's not regenerate or who has not responded in repentant faith. And the call to confession is not simply for the redeemed. It's also an opportunity for somebody who's never believed to come for the first time and experience the grace of God in Jesus. That was a good question. For the very last question, who wants the honor of the very last? Of course, I want it to be Daniel. This friend who is an encourager in chief, Daniel, what is the last question tonight? Did Jesus respond, uh, did he participate in all the liturgical points that we have here? He was busy uh, doing the gospel that now we liturgize. So in a sense, no. And in another very real sense, I don't know, because it doesn't require, so we know he went to synagogue, we know he went to the temple, we know he worshiped, but this is what's really interesting. This is why I said in what, what liturgy is not, it's not exclusive or divinely dictated. We know that there are boundaries and we wanna be within those boundaries in our worship, but we don't see a, even in the Old Testament, a command that when you come to temple, I mean, we see you have to wash in this basin and then this gets set. So that's a liturgy in a sense. But as far as what, so when the Jews went into exile, 
they didn't stop worshiping. But their worship had to change. They wanted to honor the word of God while they couldn't access the temple. They couldn't sacrifice. So what do they do? The synagogue communities pop up. And how did they worship in the synagogue communities? I'll tell you. In the words of Tevye, I don't know. We don't know. And so how did Jesus worship? What liturgy was at the synagogue in Nazareth? We don't know. But we know it fell within the bounds. And now that Jesus has accomplished the gospel, which again is the dawn of the new creation, we worship according to the contours of the gospel, trying to honor all that God tells us about how he delights in worship while simply trying to flesh it out the best we can as Sylvania Church, which is why our liturgy will look different from Calvary Baptist, who are also Reformed Baptist brothers and sisters, which will look different from Living Acts, which I don't think they do liturgy in the formal sense. It's still there, but they put clothes on it. Ours is just out for everybody to see, okay? It's a, and you can see the skeleton right there in the bulletin. These are great questions. If you have more questions, by all means, ask Shane. Let's keep that conversation going. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's pray, and then um, anybody who wants to, in 10 minutes, we're going to have a, a prayer meeting you're invited to. You don't have to come, but just we're going to spend half an hour praying God's protection over our church, and then we'll worship together on Sunday. Thank you so much for coming. This is an important thing that we're doing. Lord, we thank you that you are good, that your goodness is shown to us without avail, because we have that goodness shown in the face of Jesus Christ and in the clear words that you have recorded in scripture. We thank you that your grace covers us from beginning to end, and the fact that we're even gathered in worship is evidence of your spirit's gracious work in us in applying the work of Jesus. We ask that as we seek to glorify you um, as very sinful people, that you would help us to delight you, that we would worship in spirit and in truth, whether when we gather with liturgy or when we don't, um, that in all of it you would be pleased and that truly all of our lives would be a living sacrifice to you because Christ was sacrificed once for all for us. And Lord, um, we just commit our worship to you, both the God-glorifying, Christ-centered worship that we have been used to as a church and this slight shift of liturgy that we're enjoying now. Uh, Lord, all of it, may you have the glory and may you spread your word far beyond the walls of Sylvania Church. And as we worship you corporately, may we do so with greater depth